Uh, well, I want to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me uh, to this distinguished assemblage. Uh, I'm slightly flummoxed by the title they have assigned uh, to me, uh, Theory of Mind, Darwin's Legacy. Uh, I, my knowledge of Darwin is about the level of a, a college introductory biology a course. And the theory of mind, that expression makes me slightly nervous because that has a use among developmental psychologists, which I profoundly disagree with. The idea is that little kids have to have a theory of the mind in order that they, the neonates can respond to their mother. And I think that's a, that's a characteristic mistake of our culture, is to over-intellectualize any cognitive capacity. Uh, I have a very intelligent doggy who knows how to respond to me. His name is Tarski. Um, well, I've had four dogs, Frege, Russell, Ludwig, uh, and Tarski. Uh, and uh, Tarski doesn't respond to me because he has a theory of my mind. Oh, how does he do it? Well, he has a set of background abilities, and if there's any time, I might get to those. But anyway, I'm a little nervous about the word theory, so what I'm actually going to do is talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the nature of the mind, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, evolution. Um, <coughs> Uh, one of the most profound influences on me, uh, my mother was a medical doctor before there were any uh, women medical doctors, and she had a disconcerting habit of leaving medical specimens around the house. And one of the most disconcerting of these uh, was a, a, a fetus, a, a male fetus in a jar of formaldehyde in the garage, and it was right under, over my dad's uh, bandsaw, which I got to use. And I looked at that kid and thought a lot about him and he had a profound philosophical influence on me. And essentially, uh, the talk that I'm about to give will be an expression of that influence. Well, we could summarize it in one sentence by saying, our mind is part of nature. I don't have to tell that to this group, but you'd be surprised how inconsistent views with that have had such an amazing influence on our culture. I'm gonna start by talking about consciousness, and consciousness is something of a scandal uh, because we don't have an adequate theory of consciousness, and there are rather a uh, large number of false claims made about consciousness. Every so often I review uh, some of these in the New York Review of Books. There's a, a review by me that just came out in the January 10th issue, and then there uh, was another review, I guess, a year or two ago of what I think are mistaken theories of consciousness. Why so much of a problem about consciousness? Well, we're the victims of two uh, traditions uh, that appear to be inconsistent with each other, but in fact, uh, they trade off on each other. One is the tradition of God, the soul, and immortality that says consciousness is not a part of the natural world. Uh, consciousness, well, uh, consciousness is not a property even of the body or the brain on the Cartesian view. Uh, it's a property of the soul, and the soul is definitely not part of the natural world. This is why, incidentally, Descartes was forced to say that animals aren't conscious because all the animal has got is a body. Our bodies are not conscious for Descartes. Our brains are not conscious. It's only the soul that's conscious. Now, you might think, well, that tradition is entirely dead. No, it's not. Uh, artificial intelligence in its strong AI version is an expression of the idea uh, that the mind is not a part of the natural world. As one of the adherents of the strong view wrote, it's something formal and abstract. Descartes would have loved that. Uh, there's a, another tradition, uh, and that is the tradition of science with a capital S that says consciousness is not a suitable subject for scientific investigation. Uh, when I first got interested in this, I used to go over to UCSF and talk to the neurobiologists over there, especially Ben Libet, but others as well. And the general attitude was, in those days, consciousness is not a suitable subject for scientific investigation. It's something appropriate uh, for theologians and philosophers, but not hard-nosed scientists. As Ben once said, look, it's okay to be interested in consciousness, but get tenure first. Get tenure first. <laughs> Uh, and I've been militating against that attitude, and I think now you can get tenure by working on consciousness. So that is, uh, there's a kind of progress that has been made in that regard. But the, the attitude of uh, that uh, mental mindset was 
oh, summarized in the following fallacious syllog syllogism. Consciousness is subjective. Uh, science is objective. Uh, therefore, there can be no science of consciousness. Uh, that is such a beautiful fallacy of ambiguity uh, that I can't resist. I have a pedagogical urge to at least spend 30 seconds on it. Objectivity and subjectivity loom very large in our intellectual culture. Uh, and unfortunately, they are, the, the, the distinction is systematically ambiguous between an epistemic sense and an ontological sense. Uh, epistemically, the distinction is between types of claims, those that can be settled, as they say, as a matter of fact, and those that cannot be so settled. So if I say Van Gogh died in France, that's epistemically objective. You can settle that. If I say Van Gogh was a better painter than Gauguin, well, as people like to say, that's a matter of subjective opinion. It's not epistemically objective. But in addition to that distinction, and underlying that distinction, is an ontological distinction in modes of existence. Some entities, most of those that have been um, of interest to the natural science, have a mode of existence that's independent of anybody's attitudes or consciousness. A mountains, molecules, and tectonic plates are in that sense ontologically objective. Pains and tickles and itches are ontologically subjective. They exist only as they are experienced by a human or animal subject. Now, why is this distinction important, the distinction between the epistemic and the ontological sense of the objective-subjective distinction? And it's of crucial importance because the fact of ontological subjectivity of a domain does not pre preclude epistemic objectivity of a science of that domain. You can have a completely adequate science of consciousness uh, or mental life in general, which is epistemically objective, even though the entire domain is ontologically subjective. I'm always appalled when people say, well, you couldn't have a science of consciousness. Go to any neurology section of a university medical bookstore. Uh, these doctors have to deal with real patients that suffer, and they can't think, well, we can't really investigate pain. It's not a suitable subject for scientific investigation. OK, all of that then, let's launch into an analysis of consciousness. What is it? Uh, what are its features? Where do we stand in its scientific investigation? It's often said consciousness is hard to define. I don't think it's hard to define at all. I'm going to give you a definition. We need to make a distinction between the scientific definition that comes at the end of an investigation and the common sense definition that enables us to identify the target of the investigation. Think of water. The common sense definition is it's clear, colorless, tasteless liquid. It flows in a lake, uh, in rivers, and it exists in lakes, and comes out of the sky in the form of rain. The scientific definition comes at the end of the investigation. It's H2O. Now, with consciousness, we're still in the clear, colorless, tasteless liquid stage, and that's what I'm going to give you. Here's the definition. Consciousness consists of all of those states and events of feeling or sentience or awareness. Uh, it begins when we awake from a dreamless sleep, and it continues until we go to sleep again or die or otherwise become unconscious. On this definition, dreams are a form of consciousness. How far down the phylogenetic scale does consciousness go? We don't know, and it's probably not worth worrying about it, uh, whether or not fleas are conscious. And uh, when we get an adequate science of how the brain produces consciousness, we may be able to address that question. But there's no question that the higher animals are conscious. Uh, whenever I read some uh, philosopher who says, well, animals can't be conscious, I want to invite them over to meet Tarski. There isn't any doubt. Uh, well, anyway, I won't uh, regale you with, with um, uh, uh, anecdotes about my pets. Incidentally, it drives animal ethologists crazy that when um, uh, philosophers talk about uh, animal cognition, they always talk about their household pets instead of talking about all the great research that has been done. Well, I admire the research, but I would rely on Tarski uh, more than I would on most of the, of the laboratory studies that I've seen. Uh, OK, so that's the definition of consciousness. Now, what are some of its features? 
Well, the first feature is the one that makes it intractable. It makes it a difficult uh, subject for scientific study, and that is it's ontologically subjective. It consists of these qualitative subjective states. And that ontological subjectivity is a consequence of uh, the fact that, it's, uh, that all conscious states are qualitative. There's a qualitative character. <laughs> Uh, the character of drinking beer is different from the character of uh, working on your income tax or the character of listening to money. Every conscious state has a certain qualitative feel to it. Uh, some uh, uh, writers introduce the notion of qualia to describe this, but I think the notion is useless because the idea is that some conscious states are supposed to be qualia and others not, they're all qualitative. Every conscious state is qualitative. And you might think, well, well thinking in, in mathematics isn't qualitative. I think two plus two equals four. There's no qualitative character to that. Yes, there is. Try thinking it in French or German. Svite won't smile. Anyway, you can practice it for yourself. Um, it's a different character. So I, uh, on my account, all qualitative, all consciousness has a qualitative character. Uh, no, the notion of qualia is useless because it's supposed to distinguish one kind of consciousness from another and it fails. All conscious states are qualia. So we've got these two features. Qu consciousness is qualitative and it is subjective. Now a third feature is that there is a remarkable unity to our consciousness. I don't just uh, have the, I hear the sound of my voice and see the people uh, in the audience and feel a slight headache uh, from the uh, excellent wine we were served last night. Uh, but I have all of those as part of a single unified conscious field. And that, when we talk a little bit about evolution, that will be cr a crucial uh, in the uh, understanding of the role of consciousness, that it gives us it's misleading to say it gives us information. That's much too weak a notion. It gives us immediate access to our environment and also to the immediate past and future. I can remember what happened in the past and project my plans into the future as part of this unified experience of the conscious field. I'll say a bit more about that later. <clears throat> All right, so those are three features. Uh, qualitativeness, subjectivity, and unity. I used to think they were independent, but now I think they're really just different aspects of the same feature, and it's the essence of consciousness. Uh, you can't have qualitativeness without subjectivity. You can't have subjectivity without unity. This, incidentally, is why the split brain experiments are so interesting to us, is because it looks like the unity of consciousness is partly disrupted if you sever if you cut the corpus callosum. But there's, okay, so those are all three aspects of one feature, and it's the essence of consciousness. There's another feature, which is the fourth one. There are a whole lot of others, but I'll, I'll concentrate on these four. A fourth feature is there's no question that consciousness functions causally in our behavior. Uh, again, there are people who will say, no, consciousness doesn't function causally. It's uh, all epiphenomenal. There's no way that it could function causally. Whenever I read these guys, I think, look, I decide to raise my arm and the damn thing goes up. And it's entirely up to me. Notice we don't say, well, it's a bit like weather in Oxford. Some days it goes up and some days it doesn't go up. No, it goes up when I want it and when I decide to make it go up. And that uh, tells me, I, I mean, it's going to be, it would be uh, absurd to attempt to deny that without some overpowering evidence uh, because it's such a common experience. Notice also that this shows us the inadequacy of our traditional categories. How is it possible that the arm goes up as a result of my intention in action? Well, anything that causes the arm to go up has got to cause the secretion of acetylcholine at the axon end plates of the motor neurons, right? No acetylcholine, no arm going up. But that means that the conscious intention in action 
has to be a biochemical phenomenon. There's no way it's going to produce a secretion of acetylcholine unless it is itself realized in a biological structure. And now part of our difficulty in this is we're, we're stuck with a vocabulary that contains the traditional, uh, uh, the traditional mistakes, a vocabulary of the mind and the body, of dualism and materialism. And what I'm trying to uh, convey with this very simple example is that even for simple conscious activities like raising your arm, I, the, <coughs> the traditional categories are obsolete because you have to have the concept of a single event which has both a subjective, qualitative, uh, mentalistic description and a biochemical description. And this is familiar in nature that you have the same phenomenon, uh, same system with different levels of description. We find it difficult with the mind because one of those levels of description has a, such a sordid history. That's the, uh, the, uh, the dualistic tradition. Uh, okay, but now then, if uh, what I've said is right, that you have uh, uh, qualitative subjective unity and it functions causally in our behavior. Uh, how does it exist? What's its, how, how does it fit in with what we know about the uh, universe? And this, you will recognize, is the traditional mind-body problem. It's supposed to be a difficult problem. I think at the, at the level that we're talking about, it has a rather simple solution. And now the, the, uh, the uh, uh, the neurobiological solution turns out to be very difficult and complicated. But at this level of what is the overall philosophical situation with the relationship between consciousness and the neurobiology, it seems to me it has a rather simple uh, solution. And, and here it is. All of our conscious states are caused by neurobiological processes in the brain uh, without exception. Uh, and they're all realized in the brain as a higher level or system feature. Consciousness is a feature of uh, the brain in a way that the, let's say, the liquidity of the water in here is a feature of the system of H2O molecules. It's not something squirted out by the H2O molecules. It's the condition that the system of molecules is in. And the same way my conscious state is the condition that my brain is now in. Well, if that's how it works, why don't we get busy and figure out exactly how it works? Why is progress so slow? Uh, I don't know. I was asked to write an article for the Annual Review of Neuroscience in which I uh, surveyed a lot of the uh, literature uh, investigating uh, the uh, causation and the realization of consciousness in the brain. And it occurred to me that part of the difficulty is that the research techniques are uh, at present inadequate to address the problems that really bother us. They tend to be either imaging techniques, fMRI being the most influential, but other forms of scanning influential as well, or they tend to be single cell recordings. Uh, and much of the most uh, exciting work, uh, for example, on binocular rivalry, uh, tends to focus on very local neurobiological structures, where it seems to me more likely that we're talking about a, a much more global phenomenon. And the research techniques at present have not been able to figure out. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just to review it. There was a period when people thought the important thing is to get the neuronal correlate of consciousness, the NCC. Uh, and indeed, a lot of people did find interesting neuro neuronal correlates, correlates of different kinds of conscious states, quite fascinating uh, research. But it didn't seem to crack open the problem of consciousness in a way that I'm hoping we can be able to do. Why not? Well, for one thing, the research was always done, uh, research on blind sight or binocular rivalry or gestalt uh, switching, uh, the research was always done on agents that were already conscious. And the problem is not how does the perception modify the pre-existing conscious field, but how does the brain create the conscious field in the first place? I, you see, uh, the, the picture of perception that I have is that we shouldn't think of perception as creating consciousness, 
but we, th we should think of the sorts of perceptions that you are now having as modifying a pre-existing conscious field, a conscious field that began when we awoke this morning, assuming we awoke from a dreamless sleep, and then what perception does is add modifications to this pre-existing conscious field, and our problem is to try to figure out how the brain creates the conscious field in the first place. Uh, now, there are some people who are working on that. Uh, Rodolfo Linus in, uh, at, at uh, NYU Medical Center and uh, Wolf Singer at the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt adopt this line of approach. But the difficulty with it is, given our present research techniques, it's much harder to investigate global properties of the brain uh, than it is to investigate those properties that, have, that are localized, uh, that you can locate with specific imaging techniques and with the method of single cell recording. And I hope some of you have gone beyond that stage and maybe you can tell me about it. Okay, I'm tempted to spend the whole damn talk on consciousness, but I promise to say something about evolution. Uh, how much time have I got? You're the boss. You've got a lot of time. What? You've got a lot of time still. Okay, well I'll just, I'll talk for a while about evolution. A remarkable thing about the development of knowledge is that we, got, we get not just new uh, explanations, but new forms of explanation. And to me, the most fascinating thing about the Darwinian revolution uh, is that we got a form of explanation that previously was unknown or certainly unappreciated. And the idea was that in, in addition to the level of explanation of traditional Aristotelian uh, biology, where you had a teleological explanation of a phenotype, we substituted for that explanation two different levels. I'll give you a simple example of this. In a traditional, see, Aristotle thought there was such a thing as a final cause. There were teleological causes where the explanation had to do with seeking a goal. So if you want to explain why, let's say, fish have the shape that they do, why aren't fish shaped the way a brick is shaped? or why plants turn their leaves uh, toward the sun, you, you point out that the, the purpose of all of this, and it enables the fish to swim better and enables the plant to survive. And it's this teleological goal that uh, is, uh, well, it provides the explanation. Now what the Darwinian revolution produced was a substitution of two different levels of explanation. Instead of saying the plant turns its leaves toward the sun because it has the goal of survival, we substitute two levels of explanation. We substitute a mechanical level. The plant has variable secretions of the growth hormone auxin, and these variable secretions of auxin turn the leaves toward the sun, and, and this is the second level of explanation, plants that do that are more likely to survive than plants that don't. Now notice, survival still functions in the explanation, but survival is no longer the goal that the plant has, it's just something that happens. So we, we've inverted the conditional. Instead of saying, uh, in order to survive, you've got to turn your leaves toward the sun, uh, we now say, yeah, you're going to turn your leaves toward the sun because of the chemical secretions. And because you turn your leaves toward the sun, you are more likely to survive than if you don't. And this is a wonderful model of explanation where for the traditional Aristotelian uh, final cause or teleological cause, you substitute two levels. Survival still functions, but it no, lo they no longer functions as the goal which explains uh, the phenomenon. It's just something that happens. And this introduces another element to the explanation, the diachronic element. It exists. This kind of explanation over, only works over periods of time. Okay, I think that's a, a marvelous intellectual revolution and I'm tempted to spend a lot of time talking about it, but let's see how far we can go with it. Now, there are limits on what you can do with Darwin, Darwinian modes of explanation. Uh, and I don't know if many of you are old enough to remember this, but some uh, de couple decades ago, a few decades ago, I, there was a movement called sociobiology. And sociobiology was going to take this model of explanation 
and explain human culture, morality, civilization, philosophy, and pretty much everything else. Um, and I uh, had an occasion, at, uh, the inventor of this was Ed Wilson, a very distinguished scientist at Harvard. Uh, but there are a whole lot of other guys uh, who uh, pursued this as well. And I had a chance to debate uh, many of these characters, sometimes in print, but more often in, in uh, lectures like this. Uh, and the, uh, the failure of sociobiology is revealing to us. I've just uh, uh, favored a Darwinian mode of explanation. But what are its limits? Why did sociobiology fail? I, you know, I beg the question when I say that, but I want to explain a little bit what its limitations were. The crudest limitation that sociobiological modes of explanation had, the crudest limitation, was that it was trying to explain specific features of human culture and society, hence the name sociobiology. But the mode of explanation had to be consistent with the fact that there's been no change, no, no major change in the human gene pool over the past 30,000 years. That figure incidentally comes from a, a, a physical anthropologist in Berkeley. Maybe they're accurate, maybe they're inaccurate. I'll, I'll mention that, I'll discuss that in a moment. But now if we're gonna explain human society, think of the enormous variations in human society over the past 30,000 years. So if we want to explain things like the rise of fascism or the, uh, I, uh, the, the democratic societies produced by the Enlightenment or the existence of the Enlightenment itself, then it looks like we've got too crude an analytic weapon to work with. Suppose the figure is wrong, suppose uh, by a factor of 10, suppose uh, that uh, the human gene pool is what it is only over the past 3,000 years, same problem still arises. You still have a too much variety over the past 3,000 years for a single mode of explanation to explain it all. Well, you might say the answer to that is concentrate on universals, and that's what Wilson uh, did. I debated him once in Ann Arbor where he said, sociobiology has shown why incest is evil. For the first time, we've got an, an explanation of human morality. We've got an explanation of why incest is evil. And how is the explanation supposed to work on the analogy with the explanation I gave you of the two-level explanation uh, for why plants turn their leaves to the sun? And here's how it's supposed to work. Uh, studies have shown that children brought up in close proximity uh, to uh, people of the opposite sex lack sexual desire for those people. Uh, the favorite uh, uh, studies are always the uh, kibbutzim uh, studies, where it turns out uh, that uh, the kids brought up in one kibbutz in the communal nursery, they're brought up in that communal nursery for a long time, they lack sexual desire for other people also brought up in that nursery. They're in the, they're in the kibbutz meets Eshkaliyot, and they got no sexual desire for the people in their kibbutz. It's the, uh, kib, it's the kibbutz on the other side of the hill, the uh, Habonim over there. Then they, uh, they, they, they look much better. They're girls or the boys, as the case might be, over there. And Wilson said, well, what happens, obviously, is that close proximity during the period of development leads to a type of aversion. It leads to a sexual aversion, and this explains the incest taboo. Uh, this explains, uh, now you might ask, well, uh, what's the, the functional explanation? And the answer to that is, uh, why do we have biparental reproduction in the first place? All the authorities agree biparental reproduction is a hell of a hassle at best. Uh, and creates all kinds of social and personal problems. But the answer is that you get a much better genetic result if you mix the genes. If we just uh, reproduce like the amoeba by uh, 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 fission, if we just split, uh, we would not get uh, the advantages of mixing the genes. So you've got the functional level of explanation, the, uh, the advantages of biparental reproduction, and you've got, uh, and that is lost if you have incest and you have the, the causal level of explanation, which is the aversion. Now, does this sound to you like an adequate scientific explanation of a universal moral prohibition? It seems to me it's full of holes to begin with. 
inhibition does not explain prohibition. Uh, if this were right, that we had an innate, we had an inhibition uh, for a sexual uh, congress with members of our own, uh, with people we'd been brought up with, with people we'd grown up, grown up with in close proximity, then there'd be no need for an incest taboo. There's no need, for example, of a prohibition against eating a lot of raw mud uh, because we're just not inclined to do it. But the absence of an inclination does not explain the power of the prohibition. Furthermore, when Ed said, well, we have at last explained why incest is evil, no, they didn't explain that at all. What they did explain why it's a bad idea uh, uh, for a, a man to rape his daughter if he doesn't use precautions, if he doesn't uh, uh, do, uh, take precautions to make sure that there are no offspring of this. But the idea that the moral uh, component of, in the incest taboo is explained by there being a functional advantage to biparental reproduction and a natural in, uh, inhibition that occurs when people grow up in proximity, that seems to me much too weak. And this is, I think, why in the end, a socio-biological modes of explanation I, uh, failed as an account of the general structure of human society or as a, uh, the structure of morality. Now, that isn't to say that we can't do more than we have done with Darwinian style uh, modes of explanation. But this particular intellectual movement seemed to me doomed from the start. All right, but that then raises a question that I often hear when I talk about consciousness. Um, what's the function of consciousness? Maybe it doesn't have a function. And there are two classes of people uh, that I've argued with about this. One class says, well, consciousness must be epiphenomenal because the physical world is causally closed, and on your own account, consciousness is irreducibly subjective, and therefore it's not reducible to the objective world. It must be part, some kind of dualism must follow from this. Uh, and that, as you will have gathered already, seems to me a woefully inadequate argument. There are different levels of description of the same phenomenon, one where it's a biological level of description, another where it's a mental or subjective level of description. But that doesn't mean it exists in another realm. It's all part of the single one world that we live in. Um, but, uh, so, but that's one uh, argument. The other argument is, well, but still consciousness has no biological function because you could easily imagine uh, unconscious robots like ourselves, zombies, who did everything we do, gave lectures and wrote books and so on, while being totally unconscious. Now, there's something that Popper was suspicious of Darwinian modes of explanation because they, uh, they, were, they, can, they seemed to come too much for free. I just imagine uh, what it would be like if we didn't have this trait. And that seems to me not an adequate uh, thought experiment to say, well, consciousness has no function because we could equally imagine uh, the same uh, phenotypical behaviors without the underlying subjectivity. We can imagine that, but it's a bit like saying, look, bir uh, bird's wings have no function because we could equally well imagine birds equipped with rocket engines where they didn't need wings. And that's not how nature works. The way that nature works uh, for beings like us is we have enormous power added by the existence of consciousness, by the existence of qualitative, subjective, conscious states. What are the powers that we get? Well, the traditional vocabulary in terms of information seems to me inadequate to uh, describe the power that we get from consciousness. It's not that just that you can't do any of the traditional four Fs, the feeding, uh, fighting, fleeing, and uh, reproducing. Uh, you can't do those if you're unconscious, but all kinds of other things. It's the organization of your uh, life and, and the possibilities that you get by having an immediate conscious awareness of yourself and your surroundings increase our power enormously. And I think one illustration of this is the failure of robotics. Uh, in the latter decades of the 20th century, uh, commencement lecturers, uh, I mean, Glenn Seaborg, chancellor of my university, was one of these, would routinely say, by the end of the century, we will all have household robots that will entertain us uh, in, uh, when, our, when we're bored with light conversation and will uh, take care of the children and do all the housework and generally look after 
uh, the affairs. It didn't happen. About 1990, they stopped saying this, uh, that we're going to have it by the end of the century. What, what went wrong? Why did robotics, why has uh, robotics been such a disappointment? And the short answer is we haven't the faintest idea how to create a conscious robot. We have no idea how the brain does it. Uh, well, I won't say we have no idea, but we don't know in detail, enough detail about how the brain does it to know how we would do it artificially. I, and this is an illustration of the fact that the existence of a unified conscious field with an immediate presentation of ourselves and the environment, an awareness of both the past and the future, and sensory inputs from nearly half a dozen sensory modalities, that gives us an enormous power that we would not have without that. Now, there's an additional feature that humans have, and I don't have time to talk about that, and that is we've invented language. We got language laid on top of consciousness, I, and that, in, uh, that gives, a, again, an exponential increase in the power of what you can do with consciousness. We can create money and property and government and marriage and universities and cocktail parties and summer vacations and all of those other things that constitute human civilization. All of these require consciousness and language and a collective intentionality. Uh, so the powers that we get from consciousness are so prodigious and I want to, I guess I'll conclude by saying a bit about the unconscious. Can I talk about the unconscious for a few minutes? How much time have I got? I mean, I, oh, there's, oh, I, and when do I have to show? I want to leave time, what? Yeah, but I have to leave at least 10 minutes for questions. Okay, so I'll talk for a little bit about the unconscious. Um, it's become fashionable to say, well, really, most of our mental processes are unconscious. Conscious. So consciousness doesn't really matter. And there are wonderful experiments to show maybe consciousness is kind of going along for the ride. Uh, that the, that the, the Deca-Kornhuber experiments on the readiness potential, which were repeated by Ben Libet in San Francisco, they show you don't really initiate any of your actions. It's all done by the readiness uh, potential about two to three hundred milliseconds before you're consciously aware of what's going on. And of course, there are all sorts of other experiments uh, to show uh, that lots of what we do we're quite unconscious of. What shall we say about the unconscious? Well, it seems to me it's absolutely essential to distinguish between the unconscious as a set of mental states and processes and those cognitively significant processes that are non-conscious. They're not even candidates for consciousness. They're just neurobiological processes going on that facilitate whatever it is that we are, uh, that's uh, going on in our conscious life, but are not them, they have no psychological reality at all. Uh, my favorite is the vestibular ocular reflex. Uh, when you shake your head or move it uh, uh, up and down or right and left, your eyes will remain fixed on the uh, scene that you were seeing before. Uh, why? Well, because there's a reflex arc. It comes uh, from, um, well, I won't tell you the damned anatomy of it. It's complicated. But the, uh, the upshot of it is that it stabilizes the retinal image to have a vestibular ocular reflex. But that doesn't mean you're following a rule. It doesn't mean that you're following a rule to uh, stabilize the retinal image. Again, it's just something that happens. Now, there are lots of things like that that facilitate our cognitive functioning that have no psychological reality. Yes, but what about those things that do have a psychological reality? I have a whole lot of beliefs even when I'm not thinking about them. Even when I'm sound asleep, it's still true to say of me that I unconsciously believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. What should I say about things like that? And the answer there is, yes, there are unconscious mental states, but we understand them only on the model of consciousness. The reason that we can say I unconsciously have these beliefs is that I am able to bring them to consciousness. So the notion of the unconscious is parasitic on the notion of the conscious, because an unconscious belief, if it genuinely has psychological reality, has to be the kind of thing that you could, in principle, bring to consciousness. I have to say, in principle, because you may be blocked by brain damage or repression or forgetfulness or other things. But it can't be something 
that's not even in principle accessible to consciousness, because if so, it has no psychological reality. Now, uh, it's very important to emphasize this because the early days of cognitive science consisted in large part in attempts to get computational theories of cognitive capacities, where we were told that the computational theory has psychological reality. It's at the intermediate level. It's not uh, folk psychology and it's not neurobiology either, but it's this intermediate level that's psychologically real, but not in principle accessible to consciousness. And I want to say that's nonsense. You cannot make any sense of the idea that there's a psychological reality at that level if it, if it does not have those features that constitute accessibility in principle, even if you can't do it in fact, accessibility to consciousness. I think the, the, uh, the mood is changing in cognitive science. I think we're moving away from a computational cognitive science to cognitive neuroscience. Uh, I welcome that, I think, the future of this entire discussion that we've been having lies in a better understanding of the brain. Thank you very much.